Uh, welcome everyone to the Portable MRI uh, Journal webinar. This is, um, I'm Omar Islam, uh, one of your co-hosts today, and I'll be introducing um, um, my co-hosts and panelists um, in a second. Uh, this is brought to you by uh, Portable MRI Journal, as well as Queen's University Department of Diagnostic Radiology. Uh, we're very excited today to have two wonderful speakers uh, from, from Harvard uh, speaking about portable MRI. Uh, but before we go to them, let me introduce you, my co-host, uh, Dr. Aditya Bharata. Uh, Dr. Bharata is a good friend and colleague from the University of Toronto, where he's a staff neuroradiologist at Sid Michael's Hospital, Unity Health. He's an associate professor of medical imaging at U of T. And uh, in Canada, he's one of the foremost leaders uh, uh, in the uh, portable MRI use and experience uh, through the portable MRI machine, which is uh, in the ICU at uh, St. Michael's Hospital. I also have uh, with us who's on our panelists and he's uh, kindly agreed to, to join us and help us um, answer your questions and, and, and be part of the discussion on portable MRI is uh, Dr. Eddie Knopp from Hyperfine and, um, and Pam Moore, who's our assistant coordinator in the Department of Radiology. Uh, before uh, we start, I think Pam just wants to uh, give a couple of housekeeping messages and then I will introduce our first speaker. Yeah, I just want to say uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, just a reminder that you guys can see us as the panelists, but we can't see you. Um, so the best way to communicate with us or to ask any questions or make any comments is to use the Q&A box. Um, you can submit your questions there and then our moderators can see that. Uh, the talk is being recorded and it will be available to everybody uh, within about a week of the session. Also, when you registered, if you commented or you let me know that you will need um, a certificate of attendance for CME or any other uh, thing like that, those will be going out in the next few days based on attendance records. Um, so uh, we will do the uh, question and answer kind of towards the end, but you can put your questions in the boxes as the uh, talks go on so you don't forget them. Or if something else comes up, you can always add new questions. So uh, I hope you enjoy our session today and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Pam. So uh, uh, I want to introduce our first speaker. I'm very honored and excited to have Dr. Matt Rosen join us as the first speaker. Dr. Rosen is a physicist, tool builder, and inventor uh, whose research bridges the spectrum from fundamental physics to applied biomedical imaging work. Uh, he established the low-field MRI and hyperpolarized media lab uh, in the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging uh, to focus on continued development of new hyperpolarization methods and MRI-based tools. Uh, he directs or co-directs the Center for Machine Learning at the Martino Center. He is Associate Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School and the Kiyomi and Ed Baird MGH Research Scholar. Also, last but not least, he founded Hyperfying in 2014 with uh, Jonathan Rothberg and Ron Walshworth. So I'm very excited to uh, have Dr. Matt Rosen uh, with us. Matt, the floor is yours. Great, and can you guys hear me? Yes. Great, fantastic. Wow, um, thank you so much. I mean, this is so exciting, you know, not only to, let me get my timer going so I don't go over time here. Sorry, there we go. Um, you know, the fact that there's a journal around portable MRI is is pretty remarkable. So there's just a real convergence of things going on. Uh, these are my disclosures. As we mentioned, I think most relevant to this is that I, I did found Hyperfine. Uh, and uh, okay. So I wanna talk about work we do in my group at the Martino Center in the millitesla regime, uh, typically around 6.5 millitesla. And just to clarify some things at the outset, that's about a factor of 10 below the hyperfine scanner, which is at 64 millitesla. So this will come up uh, a number of times. So I've been doing low field MRI, millitesla MRI for about 20 years. Um, back when I was in Ron Walsworth's group, um, our student Leo Tsai and I built a six and a half millitesla uh, scanner. That's a much younger me right there. Um, with the intention of doing hyperpolarized gas imaging as a function of subject orientation. So with the patient standing up and the patient uh, laying down, because we were interested in studying how the heart lung system is affected by gravity. Um, in 2009, I took the system apart. This was my then student, Stephen Devin, supervising and set up my lab over at the MGH Martino Center. Uh, around that time, popular science gave us the moniker, the do-it-yourself MRI. And in thinking about low-field MRI over the last 20 years, I, I start to under, started to understand really that like we were doing kind of incidental 
low field MRI. You know, I had to build my own scanner so we could stand up and lay down. The, the signal comes from hyperpolarized, exogenously polarized materials. And so you didn't really need a large holding field to do MRI. So it was just easier to do to operate in the Tesla regime. But around 2010, I got a large grant from the Department of Defense, really focusing on this idea that, you know, if you want to bring magnetic resonance tools into the uh, battlefield or in forward hospitals, um, you know, those instruments could be potentially deadly in the presence of undisclosed shrapnel. And so what we've done in my group really is, is sort of like intentional uh, magnetic resonance at low field. We've established, as I will talk about, kind of a series of techniques and sequences and hardware that are kind of an existence proof that neuroimaging is possible at six and a half millitesla. And what that enables is that it enables operation anywhere. This is the hyperfine scanner. This is Taylor and I. You'll notice, of course, that this scanner is on wheels, right? Again, a high field scanner at three Tesla um, could not be on wheels for safety reasons. Of course, in the last few years, people are kind of getting the message. Even our uh, society, the ISMRM, is sort of recognizing that, oh, low field MRI, it's a thing, right? And we had our first virtual workshop last year. And, and the kind of takeaway points from that are that, you know, some applications honestly benefit from operation at low field. We're not talking about like science fair experiments, right? There's real reason to do, to do this. And we can exploit some strategies that leverage compute. Okay. So we get into a lot of things in my lab. If you met me in the 90s, you know, as was mentioned, you'd think of me as a hyperpolarized gas guy. But for the last 20 years, we've really been focused on millitesla MRI. These things in yellow are enabling techniques for low field operation. And then these applications in green are things that benefit from operation at low field. Now, this is a long list and I don't have infinite time, um, but I want to give you a flavor for some of these things. So, you know, at the outset, you can't just turn the magnetic field down and expect to make good images because, of course, as we all know, we use inductive detection to measure the rather small thermal Boltzmann polarization, right? Nuclear magnetic moments are very small, what Richard Ernst referred to as the power of evil in magnetic resonance. And so if you want to make images like these, you turn up the magnetic field, right? And the problem is actually even worse. Remember, this is inductive detection. So the signal goes like dBdt, so like B squared. In the Johnson noise dominated regime, not the body noise dominated regime, at low frequency, you're in the Johnson noise regime. The noise goes like, of course, Johnson noise, which goes like square root of B. And so you end up in a situation where your signal to noise goes like B to the three halves. So what kind of images would you expect to make at 6.5 millitesla, roughly 500 times lower magnetic field than a 3T scanner, where the B to the three halves factor is 10,000? Well, you'd probably expect uh, and not be surprised that these are the kind of images we were making back in 2005. These are a single slice of a human head, if you can believe it, acquired at six and a half millitesla in about an hour. And so what I want to talk about really is how we chose to solve this hard problem, really enabling MRI at low magnetic field through a combination of physics and compute. And you could really think of the physics as, you know, how can you interrogate the system so that you maximize your acquisition SNR, the SNR in your preamp, let's say. And then once you acquire that data, what can you do to reduce the noise or, or what the kids call uh, fixing it in post? Now, all of you know that you're going to have to do signal averaging. Again, the story I'm telling is about six and a half millitesla. Some of these things translate to the hyperfine scanner. Some don't. So please take them on their own. And so signal averaging, of course, is a painful reality at six and a half millitesla. You know, you win by the square root of the number of averages, which isn't great, but at least you're winning. So in my lab, if we want to typically acquire like a 64 by 75 by 15 matrix, we need about 30 averages. That's about 3,400 total acquisitions. And let's just look at the sequences you all know about and how well do they work at ultra low field? Well, a gradient echo is great. You do a 90 degree pulse, right? And then you wait for thermal recovery and you do another 90 degree pulse. Um, T1s are shorter at low field, so that helps a little bit, but it's still around 750 milliseconds per shot, and so that acquisition time takes 40 minutes. Remember that this work was really motivated, that is the proton non-hyperpolarized work, was really motivated by DOD neuroimaging, right? We're really thinking about uh, uh, warfighter neuroimaging, and so if you have to wait 40 minutes for a scan, that was a deal breaker. So how about flash, right? Flash is a good category of sequence. It's got fast in its name. So how does that work? You use a small tip angle, right? So you don't perturb your longitudinal magnetization. And then you crush your magnetization afterwards. You can go as fast as you want. 
typically limited by your hardware. So in my case, it's around 25 millisecond TR. So you're taking data about 30 times faster. But remember, these small tip angles means lower S and R. And so in fact, in this example, you have to actually average even more just to get back to the same place you would be with gradient echo. And, and then the outcome in both of these cases is that the total acquisition time is about the same. So the real innovation um, pulse sequence wise from my group was the use of SSFP, right? SSFP, a very valuable sequence, right? It's fully refocused with short TRs. And the idea as a cartoon, of course, is you coherently drive the magnetization back and forth very rapidly with large tip angles. And you come to a steady state within a couple shots that's quite large. In fact, at these field strengths, it can be as large as half of M0, right? And so this kind of gets us to kind of the rules of low field magnetic resonance, which is, you know, when you have low SNR, make the most of what you have. So large tip angles, sample all your magnetization, don't waste anything. So typically crushing is kind of a bad idea and don't delay, right? If you have long dead times, you're not taking data. Um, of course, Herman Carr knew this in 1958 when he wrote down SSFP. He wasn't doing imaging, of course, he was doing spectroscopy, but he had long T1s and he had uh, low magnetic fields as well. So when you do SSFP, and again, this is from our 2015 paper, this is uh, 3D imaging that took about six minutes to acquire, about two and a half millimeter in plane, 6.5 millitesla. Um, compare that to what I showed you earlier, which was in the same scanner at the same field strength with the wrong sequence, right? So if you want to do these things at low field, thinking about data rate, right? The rate at which you take data, the rate at which you can acquire information is very important for evaluating sequences. Um, just very briefly, our coils look like this. They're a little bit different from, from what many of you are used to. Uh, this is technology we developed in my lab. A very, very interesting thing to think about. Our Larmor frequency is 276 kilohertz, right? And so the way we tune and match these coils is we wind them on this former. We hook it up to a 1935 decade capacitor boxes. We turn the match to tune those uh, those values, and then we read the values and solder them in. Incredibly easy. Uh, my group is right down the hall from Larry Wald's Advanced RF Lab, and they're building coils for 7T. And so, uh, that, you know, this is uh, one of the few things that are easier at low field. So, of course, SSFP is an interesting sequence, but it's not used too much for whole head uh, imaging at high field for a very interesting reason. What I've written down here is the steady state transverse magnetization as a function of frequency offset. So if you want to operate in this region here, where you don't get the so-called banding artifact, where the signal goes to zero, you need to hold an absolute homogeneity, not a fractional homogeneity, an absolute homogeneity of less than around 10 hertz over your whole field of view. Very easy at low field. That's 36 parts per million at 6.5 millitesla, but that's 100 parts per billion at 3 tesla, which, as all of you know, is impossible because even if your magnet was shimmed that well, magnetic susceptibility artifacts from, say, the air uh, sinus interface cause banding. And so here's the same subject 3T and 6.5 millitesla. And at our low fields, we don't see any banding. Um, right away, this gives you an interesting idea that sometimes you can get more information at low field than at high field. So this was a, a, a patient imaged at 3T and 6.5 millitesla. They had open skull TBI, uh, traumatic open skull TBI, followed by surgical resection, and the uh, cranioplasty was lined with a titanium mesh. And interestingly, when we scan this subject at low field, look at the surgical margins here in green. This patient appears to have more brain at low field, right? Well, of course, they don't have more brain. They have less susceptibility artifact. And so the interesting thing is, if you were monitoring this patient following the surgical resection, you might miss uh, a hemorrhage or bleed at high field, but you'd be able to see it at low field. Okay, so SSFP, it's maximally efficient at low field. The signal goes like T2 over T1 at our ultra low field. That ratio is unity. And so, you know, we have very, very nice ways to acquire data. But of course, contrast is what all the neuroradiologists care about. And our images are kind of like proton density, which, which is really a shame because, as many of you know, I've plotted here T1 versus field strength. And there's a lot of interesting T1 dispersion in the range where we operate. And we have no way to tap that with this fast sequence. Okay. So, so far, I've talked about ways that you can make pretty good images at ultra low field if you have a high data rate and you do signal averaging. Another approach to maintain a high data rate 
is to continuously dither your acquisition per, uh, parameters, like your tip angle and your TRs. This comes out of the really pioneering work from Dan Ma and Mark Griswold of fingerprinting. And so this is what fingerprinting looks like at six and a half millitesla in a structured phantom. You can see here on the left, we're changing the tip angle and the TR. The images are coming in. There actually is banding because the TRs are getting quite long. You acquire all of this data, and then you plot the signal trajectory at each voxel as a function of shot. When you reconstruct this, Historically, people used a dot product match, but we use something that we call drone, which is a deep reconstruction network approach. You not only can recover proton density, but all the interesting quantitative relaxation properties as well as field maps. Doing this in vivo works as well. This is data from a number of years ago, and now we actually have a fast way to interrogate this region, which is quite nice. Um, I did mention our coils, and for those of you who are interested in hardware, you might care about this. This is a structured phantom in, a, in one of these helmet-shaped coils. You can see that B1 homogeneity actually kind of falls off as we get further away from the crown of the head. Um, so this is work by my postdoc, Shang, that was published in 2021, where you can actually solve this. Again, these low frequencies are kind of like DC, right? So you don't need to do some fancy EM solver. You can just use the biot savart equations and a linear programming model. And so we just come up with an algorithmic approach for deciding how many turns to put at each one of these little grooves, and you can make these very, very nice homogeneous coils. We're also doing this now for, for breast imaging. So, um, you know, you can continue to innovate in this space. We have a quadrature coil, which works quite nicely, built by, by uh, now junior faculty in our lab, Neha Kunju. Um, you know, of course, this is just taking a page from David Holt's work. At some point in time, you know, we've got like the best coils, we've got really efficient sequences, our noise floor is at the Johnson noise limit. Like, is that it for us at ultra low field? The joke in my lab used to be like, well, we can't make the signal any higher. Can we just like delete the noise, right? And so many of you are, are familiar with the work from my former postdoc, Bo Zhu. We published this in Nature back in 2018. It's, a, it's what we call AutoMap, Automated Transform by Deep Manifold, uh, by Manifold Approximation, excuse me. And the idea is that it's an end-to-end, -end, it, it treats reconstruction in general, not just for magnetic resonance, as an end-to-end -end supervised learning task where you go directly from the sensor domain, say K-space, to the image domain through a learned approach. And this data-driven approach, which is really trained on the forward model, remember, these problems are easy to write down the forward model for, right? We can do that like in second grade, we know how to write down the forward model for say Cartesian MR. Solving the inverse problem can be challenging in certain cases, right? So AutoMap learns to invert an arbitrary forward model, which is very interesting, but also um, the low dimensional internal representation in the neural network is a learned joint sparse manifold that actually allows you to become more immune to noise and improve your RMSE and SNR. Um, this is what it looks like when it's trained. It's a very simple network. This was very early in the space of machine learning. We're one of the first people to actually go from directly from case space to reconstructed images. This is from the Nature paper. Many of you have seen this. The nice thing about this trained approach is it allows you to go from, again, any encoding to the image uh, domain, improving SNR in all cases. Um, most importantly for this talk, let's look at it at low SNR. So here's a funny experiment. 800 averages, right? I can hear all of you chuckling. A single slice in a structured phantom, it took 26 minutes at six and a half millitesla. And the learned approach and the Fourier approach look the same. But as you take less and less data, you can see that the learned approach outperforms the SNR and accuracy of the Fourier transform approach. And I plotted here, not the best metric, but it's the ratio of SNR from the learned approach to the FFT approach. I'm um, doing this in vivo is really nice. And they have published this back in 2021. Um, we get improved SNR uh, increases of around a factor of one and a half to two and a half. Um, and interestingly, the scanner was misbehaving this day. There's a bit of a zipper artifact. And you can see that AutoMap just removed it, right? How is that possible? We didn't train the network to know anything about zipper artifacts, but the network was trained again on the forward encoding of natural images, right? Natural images, things that humans think are visually interesting, cats and birds and flowers and brains and all kinds of things like this. An artifact that goes from bright to dark, from bright to dark to bright to dark is very unnatural. You don't actually generally see this in natural images. And so the network just says, oh yeah, we're, we're going to attenuate that in the transformation. So this very nonlinear learned approach is very beneficial in the low SNR regime. Okay, so like, have we solved low field MRI? Well, it, we've learned a lot in my lab from six and a half millitesla experiments. You know, 
being able to do SSFP, so magnets that have sufficient uh, homogeneity, high efficiency coils, fingerprinting for contrast, auto map. In incidentally, all of these things are benefit from GPU. That gets you pretty good images, right? And then, of course, once you understand the low field physics, you can come up with different instantiations of how you're going to do this. This is a, a figure from a 2007 DARPA proposal that I put together. This magnet has the same homogeneity as our big magnet. And, and of course, I did mention that um, SNR goes like B to the three halves. And so you can, of course, tweak that magnetic field a little bit if you're interested in improving the SNR. So of course, right, realizing that once you understand the low field physics means you could build application specific scanners, led Ron Walsworth, Jonathan Rothberg and I in 2014 to found Hyperfine. So of course, here's the 64 millitesla Hyperfine scanner next to the six and a half millitesla, let's call it physics machine. Um, Taylor is going to talk about all of these results. I, I just want to kind of give a little teaser here. You know, once you can do MRI at the bedside, it's just remarkable what's possible. Okay, this is, of course, the, the hyperfine scanner uh, at the bedside with a comatose patient at Yale New Haven Hospital. So I will skip through these things and the uh, work that we, the three of us, Kevin Shea at Yale, Taylor at MGH, and myself as the three PIs of a AHA Collaborative Science Award have been able to do, um, which he will talk about. And, you know, really, Again, thinking about the initial motivation for the neuroimaging sector of my career, not the lung imaging sector of my career from 20 years ago, location matters, right? Operation at low magnetic field is what matters. Um, this is some other work that's come out recently from our collaboration. This is um, work from my, my colleague Eugenio Iglesias, where we're using now super resolution approaches to take low field portable MRI, bedside MRI, make synthetic high resolution uh, images, which are actually not that accurate compared to the high field ground truth. But when you segment them, they are extremely accurate and give you quantitative morphological measurements that are comparable with high field work. Okay. So in the, I don't know, seven minutes I have left, huh, um, I want to talk about like what's next for us in my lab. I didn't just shutter my lab when I founded Hyperfine. Um, we continue to do interesting physics things in this low field regime, because some things are better at low field, some things are impossible at high field, and some things are just plain old different. And I want to give a taste of some of these things. So I'm at the Martino Center, right? You know, where Jack Beliveau and Bruce Rosen did their seminal work in bold imaging. And so functional imaging is a thing everyone asks me, right? And as we know, bold is a functional imaging approach that takes advantage of the differences in, in uh, magnetic susceptibility between oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. And as such, it's really the realm of high and increasingly ultra high field MR. So what kind of magic can I show you that gives us bold contrast at low field? Well, there is no magic. There is no bold contrast at six and a half millitesla. Um, so what we've been working on actually is something that Larry Wald and Thomas Fitzel wrote down in 2008, which is that you could spin lock to the neuronal frequency that you're interested in. And then the NMR signal would be modulated by the presence of an endogenous say nano Tesla level, level neuronal stimulus field. The problem with this approach is that actually, if you do these experiments, say at three Tesla, the bold effect can dominate. And SAR, remember it's a spin lock pulse, right? Can really limit how long you can apply the spin lock pulse. So now all of you listening are experts as to why we can do this at low field. There's no bold. SAR goes like B squared, so or omega squared, right? And so you can apply very, very long spin locks at low field. And the thing you're trying to measure in this case, the endogenous neuronal signal is independent of whatever field you're applying this at. So this is work that was done by Bragi Svensson when he was a postdoc in my group. Now he's a junior faculty member at the Martino Center, published in 2020, and we call it steady state SIRS. So here's an SSFP sequence and we wrap a spin lock experiment inside of there. If there's any stimulus current, any neuronal signal at the frequency at which we're spin locking, we see a large shift. In tip angle, which builds up over many shots, it gives you a huge effect on the steady state signal. It's like a 1% effect for a one nano Tesla field. And so um, this is really an interesting approach. So I want to jump a little bit and talk about uh, something that may seem out of the ordinary. But again, this is the portable MRI journal, right? You never said portable medical MRI. <laughs> so, you know, I've showed you already that reduced susceptibility can eliminate this bold confound for functional imaging. Sometimes it can give you more information. It also enables field operation. And, and then actually, in this case, I literally mean MRI in the field, in the hot sun of plants in College Station, Texas. This is a big ARPA-E project that I co-lead. Um, and we're not the first person to do plant root imaging. This is Paul Bottomley, you know, 
what didn't Paul Bottomley do back in 1986? But within a year, he recognized that doing this in natural soils and clay soils really produces poor images at one and a half T. And so we built a scanner that operates at two megahertz, that for, that's 47 millitesla, put it right there in the ground. And these are some images that we're making of plant roots in Texas. Um, I should talk a little bit about contrast. I'm being conscious about the time here. So this is another question people always ask about, you know, can you use gadolinium at six and a half millitesla? Remember where I work is six and a half millitesla. Well, re the reality is you can't give enough gadolinium at my field strength owing to the low relaxivity and small paramagnetism of gadolinium. Uh, and so what we've been working on for the past couple of years, this is work uh, by my former student, David Waddington, that we published in Science Advances uh, in 2020, using spions, so super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles. These can have huge magnetizations, and these magnetizations actually persist into the ultra low field regime. So, you know, I was showing you before that there's no magnetic susceptibility artifact at our field strengths, right? But when you put, you know, 300 micromolar of these 25 nanometer spions and do SSFP, oh my God, look at all that banding, right? And so we've used this actually to make your um, signal more or less sensitive to the off resonance signal just by changing the tip angle and exploiting the the, uh, the uh, selectivity of SSFP. And so here's some examples from the paper. Uh, this is in rats. So if you go on resonance, this blue curve here, your contrast is really about, uh, you get relaxivity contrast because you're only looking at the on resonance signal. So this is kind of what you would expect, right? You get dark relaxivity contrast, the lungs, the liver, the kidney, and the spleen. But if you do the same measurement, but change the tip angle to say 20 degrees, you're operating here on this red curve. So you get bright signal when you're off resonance. And so here, in this case, the liver lights up. So we're getting either susceptibility contrast or relaxivity contrast, depending on where you operate. That's kind of an inter interesting strategy. I have to cut through <laughs> all of these things, uh, which I wanted to share with you. Um, I'm going to actually just quickly talk about this. So hyperpolarization, again, I started this talk with about hyperpolarization. In that case, we were taking uh, helium-3 and doing optical pumping spin exchange and then inhaling or transporting that hyperpolarized agent. Overhauser DNP, right, which operates on the electron-proton coupling through the hyperfine interaction, is a very interesting way to do hyperpolarization, and you can actually do it in situ. So this is work that we've done with Nano diamonds published in Nature Comms in 2017. Nano diamonds are very small. You can tell from their name, 125 nanometer. In this case, they have all of these little surface defects, which are electron-like. So each one of those is like a Bohr magneton. Remember, Bohr magnetons, 660 times higher magnetic moment than protons at any field strength. And so we use the, again, the hyperfine interaction, the electron-proton double resonance interaction um, to transfer that in aqueous solutions. And so here's an example right out of the paper. Um, so these gray vials contain aqueous solutions of nanodiamonds. The white vials are just water, regular MRI, magnitude and phase. You cannot tell the players apart. But when you turn on the electron saturation field, which is 191 megahertz at our field strength, the diamonds light up. So this is amazing, right? So what we're doing is, number one, we're doing electron saturation, which you can do in vivo at these field strengths, 190 megahertz, right? And this isn't relaxation contrast. This is hyperpolarization that turns on and off with uh, RF controllable saturation fields. This is the last slide I'll show about this. We have done this in vivo. We published some of this work in 2018. This is in a rat model, an MCA uh, occlusion, uh, where there was injected stable free radicals. And you can see the signal lights right, right up. And you get a huge enhancement and phase inversion in this case. Let me jump to the end. Oh, that is the end. So <laughs> hopefully, um, I've convinced some of you that MRI is possible in the millitesla regime, despite there being lots of things to keep you up at night, uh, mostly obsessing about noise floor. And of course, Taylor is going to dig into uh, the real practical uses of this technology. Uh, but in my case, it's really from a combination of physics and compute. I gave a few examples and I skipped over a few examples of interesting use cases for magnetic resonance uh, experiments, both MRI and NMR at low field, uh, some of which use hyperpolarization, some of which don't. Um, you know, the implications for healthcare, again, Taylor is going to talk about this, but, I, you know, it's very interesting to think about what Steve Schiff, who's a pediatric neurosurgeon, many of you know him, you know, really said low cost MRI could revolutionize medical care. And here he is at the Care Children's Hospital in Uganda. Um, you know, what I want to talk about with all of you afterwards in the panel is, is, you know, 
as I said, some applications honestly benefit from low field, not all applications. It's not the cure for everything. How will each of you want to use these tools in the 21st century? And I know I've gone over time. I have to acknowledge my group, members past and present, and our funding agencies. And thank you very much for, for putting up with me. Thank you, Thanks, Dr. Sir. Rosen. Thank you, Dr. Rosen. That was really an outstanding uh, presentation. And I have to say, I, I was not expecting uh, to find out that uh, from your perspective, um, the hyperfine scanner is a high field unit. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really remarkable to see, um, you know, the ability to, to produce images and, and the thought process that goes behind uh, changing the, the pulse sequence design and even even what is generating the image contrast that that was really really uh, fascinating to me so I, I thank you for that what we're going to do is hold questions for now and go straight into the next talk and then um uh, just to let the the uh, members who are signed on know that we'll we'll have a question and answer at the end and if we run over a little bit if, if people are willing to stay uh, we, we'll keep going until uh, uh for a little bit longer if we need to for the question and answer so it's my pleasure now to introduce uh dr uh, taylor kimberly uh, dr kimberly is the chief of the division of neurocritical care at massachusetts general hospital and associate professor of neurology at harvard medical school um, he's a clinical neurologist. He looks after patients in the neurocritical care ICU and in the neuro uh, recovery clinic, and also leads a research group that conducts translational studies, uh, bridging basic science and patient-oriented research. Um, he's recognized for uh, developing uh, blood and imaging biomarkers for clinical trials in brain edema, is a co-PI of phase three CHARM trial, and his laboratory has been developing and, um, and researching clinical applications of low field MRI in the inpatient outpatient setting. Outside of work, Taylor enjoys Nordic skiing, cycling, and hiking with his uh, wife and three daughters. And it's a great privilege to have him here uh, to talk to us about their experience with the uh, ultra low field uh, MRI uh, at Mass General. Thanks, Adija. I, I didn't actually realize you were going to share that last little bit, but thank you for doing so. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, thank you also um, uh, for the invitation to uh, participate in this webinar and um, and the opportunity to talk about uh, clinical applications of, of uh, low field uh, MRI. Let me pull up my slides here. Okay, good. So um, uh, you heard an, uh, what I thought was an excellent uh, summary of some of the uh, physics and uh, scientific underpinnings of low field or very or ultra low field MRI. Um, I'll pick up the story and talk uh, a little bit about uh, our experience in uh, in using this in clinical application. But first. moment. There we are. Uh, my disclosures, and again, just to point out of these, I do have, uh, through my institution, a, a sponsored research agreement with Hyperfine. Uh, so you, you heard a wonderful uh, historical perspective from, from, from Matt, uh, dating back uh, uh, many years. Uh, my involvement in, uh, in low field uh, portable MRI uh, came a little bit later in this in in the stage of development uh, back in around uh, 2015 2016 as hyperfine was getting started I had the opportunity to join with Matt and and Kevin uh, Sheth at Yale and um, uh, partner uh, with hyperfine to think about ways that low field MRI could be used in the clinical setting and one of the things that I I find striking in terms of thinking about um, the last uh, five years or so is just the rate of development in the quality of the images coming off a, scan a scanner at 64 millitesla. Um, and, and these images show that over a period of the first several years, uh, some of the proof of concept uh, imaging was coming off this uh, scanner, which is, as Matt said, is 10 times higher magnetic field than the 6.5 uh, millitesla research unit that, that's uh, in his lab. And, uh, and that the, the, uh, the uh, uh, options and availability of additional pulse sequences, including by uh, 2017 into 2018, uh, DWI imaging really created a suite of uh, sequences that opened the door for, for clinical applications. 
And you know, one thing that I would say is that when when thinking about the translation from uh, you know uh, proof of principle, demonstration of of ability to, to to image, and then thinking about applying that into a clinical setting, it obviously has to apply. You have to have a harmonized form factor and unit that can work for all sorts of individuals, and uh, and it also has to have a a core set of imaging sequences. And in those first few years, that was uh, clearly the uh, the um, the focus of development, um, such that by 2018, uh, when the first scanner was installed over at Yale in Kevin's group, um, there were a series of uh, standard sequences that we're all familiar with, and uh, and, and there were images being uh, generated off off uh, uh, the uh, low field scanner that look um, look very much like uh, the types of uh, scans that we see on conventional MR, except in with lower resolution. Uh, the one caveat is uh, that the time of uh, needed to acquire these images each were in the ten to fifteen minute range. Uh, <clears throat> And then um, uh, two years later, and, and, and uh, I, was, <laughs> I was amused to see that Matt had the very same photo, um, we received uh, a unit uh, over here at MGH in our, our neuro ICU, one of now three units uh, that we've been uh, working with. And um, very quickly during that period of time, the uh, quality of the sequence, pulse sequences uh, as well as some of the, most recently, some of the hardware has improved so that now the image quality that's coming out, and I'm showing here an example of a stroke patient with a right MCA stroke, uh, we're able to get um, a detection of pathology um, and the scan acquisition times uh, are really comparable or nearly comparable uh, to uh, to conventional MR. So this, this um, development uh, timeline from uh, 2015 or so up to um, uh, to the current day has really um, really uh, undergone a tremendous leaps and bounds. Now, the one thing I would say is we know there's when thinking about imaging and thinking about its application to uh, clinical scenarios, there's this interaction, almost like a triangle between the length of time of an acquisition or a sequence, the uh, resolution, and then the sensitivity for detecting pathology. And, and there's always a, a, an interaction between each of these. It, generally, you, you can't tip the scales towards one without affecting uh, the impact on one of those other uh, factors. And that's always been the challenge in figuring out how to apply, uh, frankly, MR in any, in any scenario, but, but certainly applies in the, in the low field regime as well. Of course, one other element that, uh, uh, that uh, is embedded in in a portable MRI is is really a fourth dimension, and that's what really is uh, uh, at least as a clinician the most exciting aspect about uh, this technology from my perspective, as I'm sure it is from yours. And that's that there's the accessibility and portability, so that this fourth dimension allows us to conceive of applications for this uh, scanning technology in arenas that previously were unimaginable. Uh, for conventional MR. So it's really this, this process of identifying a trade-offs between these factors and, and uh, finding the right uh, use case scenarios. And so that's um, uh, really the stage at, we're at which we're at. And I, I apologize, I didn't include some of the um, proof of principle publications that together with Kevin uh, Sheath and Matt Rosen, we've published over the last several years. Because what I really wanted to do is instead spend a few moments uh, before we go to the uh, Q and A session, uh, thinking about these uh, how we're, or I should say, sharing how we're thinking about these use case scenarios. Because I think this is where the fun part is, from a clinical perspective, is thinking about how to leverage the strengths of this type of technology um, and and understanding where it can be most useful. So I'll show two. I'll share two examples of ones that we're working on. And uh, the first is in, is in the realm of acute stroke. And um, one, of the, uh, one, one of the features for those that um, may, may not be quite as familiar as uh, acute stroke care today, but it's really an evolving landscape. And so placing a novel uh, diagnostic technology within that landscape requires some careful thought. 
And part of the reason is that a lot of the clinical decision-making is exceptionally time sensitive. And, uh, and, and so it just needs to be thought about uh, carefully. Uh, moreover, the, uh, the algorithms and the clinical algorithms for how to evaluate and make uh, uh, rapid uh, uh, treatment decisions within acute stroke have increased in, in complexity. And having come back uh, from the International Stroke Conference last week, uh, I can attest that, that, uh, that those algorithms are continuing to evolve and will continue to evolve quite dramatically. But the general concept in, in uh, the care of this uh, particular patient population is, is that time is of the essence. So, so then the question arises, what is the sweet spot for a technology that has portability, but uh, requires, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes of time uh, to, um, to, to use the technology um, and, and, and not have that interfere with a um, time as brain uh, clinical algorithm. And <clears throat> one of the uh, important features is that imaging really is central to the evaluation and management of acute stroke uh, patients. And it really is integral to the guidance of treatment decisions, whether it's uh, intravenous TPA, which is a uh, pharmacotherapy for the uh, dissolution of, of uh, clots that, that cause ischemic stroke, or mechanical thrombectomy, uh, where, where it's an endovascular or surgical approach to removing the clot. But the key is, is that imaging is really central to those, um, to those, uh, uh, those clinical decision-making. Now, uh, portable MR and, and low-field MR is unlikely, certainly as a starting point, uh, is unlikely to have an easy uh, place within that very tight time uh, uh, time-dependent algorithm to slot in and demonstrate value. So that's really not the place to start to um, to evaluate it in this in this arena. On the other hand, there is an is a clinical scenario where it can be exceptionally useful, and that is that in the last several years, the last five or ten years, uh, it it's been um, recognized that a number, actually a pretty large proportion of patients, about 25% of patients, will wake up with stroke symptoms. So they'll go to bed feeling normal and they'll wake up. Since a lot of the treatment decisions depend on time and the passage of time since the stroke onset, this patient population typically does not qualify for treatment. But uh, uh, it, it's likely that they can if there's a way to to safely identify those patients who wake up with their stroke symptoms, or at the time they wake up, that's the start of the stroke, versus those who suffer a stroke in the middle of the night but don't wake up. And what was recognized is that uh, MRI features on the T2 flare, as well as on the DWI sequence, could serve as a surrogate uh, tissue clock uh, in lieu of the usual time clock that defines uh, treatment windows for uh, thrombolysis and thrombectomy. And so this concept of being able to detect an acute ischemic stroke on the DWI, which is shown here on the top three examples where uh, a hyper intense uh, stroke lesion on these three cases, where on the T2 flare, if it is undetectable, it really uh, uh, matches uh, folks who have a stroke uh, that are three uh, uh, or four and a half hours or less in age, whereas, and that's shown on this left-hand side where there's no hyperintensity in the region where the DWI lesion is. Uh, the middle example where there's perhaps some subtle T2 flare hyperintensity, um, as well as uh, on the right-hand side, an example where there's an obvious uh, visible T2 flare hyperintensity that uh, overlies the region where uh, that is identified as a stroke. And these these changes occur in a time-dependent manner. And if you use, if you leverage these features, you can identify patients who are within a three or four and a half hour time window, which is the typical time window uh, for making decisions around thrombolysis. And although it may not be that sensitive, meaning it, uh, uh, it, it is, um, there are some patients who will have flare detect, uh, detectable lesions in that time window, if it's clean, 
it's highly specific. And that's really what you want when you're making a clinical decision around using a treatment that in theory could kill someone from a hemorrhagic transformation. And shown here is an example. And this, this was all shown in conventional MRI at 1.5 or 3T. <clears throat> Some of this work really out of got, uh, Gertz Tamala from uh, Germany, who really led the field uh, uh, 10 years ago. And what he uh, showed on the left-hand side is that if you're in that first zero to 60 minute or first hour window, two, three, or four hour window, there's a, uh, a enrichment for patients that are flare negative. There still will be some flare positive, but as long as you're reasonably confident that someone is flare negative and within that four and a half hour time window, then you're good to go to make a, throm a thrombolysis decision. And to his credit, he was able to organize a multi-center randomized clinical trial called the Wake Up uh, Trial, where he used MRI as a tissue clock to guide thrombolysis in patients who had an unknown stroke uh, on uh, uh, time of onset. And what's remarkable is that those individuals who, or those patients who were allocated randomly to thrombolysis had a better uh, three-month outcome compared to those who were allocated to placebo, as shown in this uh, modified rank and scale score, which is a, uh, a scale of disability, where the uh, lighter the color, is better, the darker the color is bad. And you can see on the top set of bars that there is a larger proportion of lighter color relative to darker color. And so this really demonstrates the principle that MRI can be used in this patient population to select, uh, select treatment. Now, that's great. And this was really an exciting uh, result back in 2018 when, um, when uh, the wake up investigator shared it, that but the reality is, is that at most hospitals and most emergency rooms, they don't have access to a conventional MRI, particularly one in, a, in that uh, hyperacute setting that can be used to guide this treatment. So this is, this is really an exciting result, but it's not really applicable or accessible to most patients who present to, uh, to emergency rooms. So that really... Because of that uh, lack of accessibility, but the proof of this, uh, this principle in guiding uh, clinical decisions, this really is the sweet spot for, um, for low field and portable MRI. Again, um, uh, uh, Matt had, had briefly touched on this as well. And, and again, I'll just highlight it again that uh, we have shown together with Kevin Sheth that, uh, that the scanner is capable of acquiring their proof of principle that it can acquire T2 a flare and DWI images in uh, stroke patients. This was performed in this subacute setting. So patients who were largely a day or later after their stroke onset. But again, it showed that these images could be acquired and could even be acquired in critically ill or, or in patients with complex medical disorders, not a, a, a trivial uh, feature. And so what that's done is, is guided us on a current effort um, together with Hyperfine and two other academic medical centers, uh, we're um, conducting a study where we're enrolling, rather than subacute patients, acute stroke patients, obviously with an enrichment in the first uh, four and a half to six hours, but we're taking patients up to the first 24 hours, and we've created a streamlined imaging protocol that focuses on the two sequences that can be used for uh, 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 clinical decision-making, and right now we're in the process of demonstrating uh, that we can replicate this principle of flare and DWI mismatch as a tissue surrogate. And I'm showing here work uh, that uh, Anna, Anna, Annabelle um, Sorby Adams in, in my group has been leading the effort on in already and even in some of our initial uh, uh, experience, we're showing that that flare signal hyperintensity uh, appears to be following that same pattern. Uh, a few uh, examples here on the right-hand side uh, uh, where um, uh, a flare image, uh, uh, these are on the left-hand uh, column uh, of images and a DWI uh, B900 on the right-hand column of images at one hour after uh, stroke onset, five hours and 24 hours. And what's really um, encouraging to us is that even a very small strokes uh, as seen on the bottom example, are uh, detectable in this scanner, suggesting that 
it'll have a sufficient safety margin for detecting these small strokes and helping guide these decisions ultimately uh, when, when uh, combined with uh, thrombolysis. So this is one example of, uh, oh, and I'll say one other thing about this is that uh, has been a, a principle um, uh, even uh, up to uh, uh, up to now is that what's particularly exciting is that the quality of the sequences continues to improve through innovation, uh, similar to what Matt had described. Uh, similar efforts are ongoing uh, within Hyperfine, and that has uh, really um, made uh, 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 as a uh, as a clinician seeing these scans coming off uh, the the scanner. Um, they're really quite uh, quite impressive. An example here showing a, a PCA stroke where um, the B900 ADC and flare uh, are nicely pick up a, a, a small stroke for a patient who presented with loss of vision. Okay, so um, I'll move on in the interest of time and briefly touch on another uh, use case scenario. And, and that is, is that um, in addition to detecting pathology, as in the example I've shared in acute stroke, another important um, application uh, uh, is a quantitative morphometry. And this, uh, the, the ability to segment and, um, and uh, uh, derive uh, volumes of brain substructures has value not only uh, for research applications, but as well for clinical applications. One of, the, um, one of the key features of this though is developing a processing or post-processing pipeline to really facilitate that process in a low, uh, low field regime. And again, Matt had alluded to this uh, together with uh, uh, Eugenio at, Mar at the Martino Center. We've been working to develop a uh, machine learning uh, algorithm that uh, Eugenio has, uh, has developed, it's uh, uh, Synthesar which is a super resolution algorithm that can take low resolution inputs and generate a, a T1 MP range, one millimeter isotropic synthetic scan, which is shown uh, in this middle set of images. And when compared to the authentic one millimeter uh, isotropic MP range images, it's really quite extraordinary how um, how uh, close in similarity the results are. And in fact, both can be um, submitted through a semi-automated uh, segmentation pipeline. And the, um, the volumes that are derived from those, whether it's the cerebral cortical, uh, gray matter, the white matter, the hippocampus, the CSF, the uh, correlation uh, and the uh, uh, degree of agreement is, is uh, quite impressive. And so we're very interested now in uh, leveraging that for uh, serial uh, lo and longitudinal monitoring of brain volumes, whether it be hippocampal, hippocampal volumes or other, uh, for a variety of neurologic diseases, including multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's disease. And finally, uh, using Eugenio's uh, uh, algorithm, uh, it can also be leveraged to identify uh, errors uh, 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 or deviations from the expected, which is a, a can be leveraged to identify and highlight pathology as shown here. So there are a variety of ways in which we're exploring uh, how this uh, technology can be used for uh, clinical use case scenarios. But one of the things that makes it most exciting is that um, there will always be a role for conventional MR where that current paradigm where we bring the patient to the MR suite, uh, there's always gonna be a need for high resolution uh, imaging um, uh, for important diagnostic questions. But there are certain circumstances where that's either not feasible or the portability portability can be leveraged for point of care imaging and, um, and identifying those environments, whether it's the ED, the ICU, or inpatient floors in the clinics, out in the community, uh, even in the pre-hospital setting or in uh, uh, rural or low resource environments, there, the 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 um, uh, the opportunities really are wide open for how to uh, how to um, uh, apply this technology for these use case scenarios. So again, um, a lot of exciting particular uh, uh, ways in which this can be developed. I shared with you two examples, including wake up stroke and brain morphometry. And really, the exciting thing is that this has the ability to democratize uh, imaging. I'll just acknowledge. Uh, not only members of my lab, but uh, collaborators, including, of course, Matt and Eugenio, as well as Kevin, 
uh, neuroradiology colleagues uh, at MGH, as well as our emergency medicine colleagues that we collaborate with. So thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Kimberly, for that uh, outstanding uh, presentation and uh, that look at uh, one of the uh, emerging applications of this technology. So um, we do have a couple of uh, questions in the chat. So I think we'll start with uh, one that was emailed in. Um, so this one came from uh, Dr. Frank Shellock, who's uh, well known in the MRI community for his work in MRI safety. And his question, which really applies to all of us, I guess, on the panel, um, but maybe we could start with you, Taylor, is um, he asked about uh, specifically if any medical implants have been tested and labeled for scanners operating below 1.5 T. So actually, maybe that's one to ask Eddie. But then uh, he asked how we manage patients referred for MRI exams. And I guess I'll broaden it a bit and ask uh, if people would comment on whether they are scanning patients who are considered to be classically contraindicated at high field. Um, so maybe, Eddie, just to start, do you know whether any implants are actually specifically rated at ultra-low? My feeling about what I've seen is that most of them specify a field strength not to be exceeded, if you will, but they don't prohibit the lower field. Um, do you have anything more to comment regarding anything specifically labeled for uh, scanners below 1.5 T? <clears throat> Aditya, that's correct. So nothing is specific at this point in time. Yeah. Any any usages are being done off-label. And we have seen a lot of our clinical sites doing off-label imaging without any untoward effect. There are also some sites that are undergoing <clears throat> a more research approach to investigating things such as pacemakers, implantable cardiac defibrillators. That being said, in addition, and I saw what, this was a question as well, we have two sites as part of a study that are looking at the scanner within the ECMO environment themselves. We have some anecdotal people, again, all off-label. These research sites are being done under IRB, but anecdotally, additional sites, ECMO patients with external implanted, with external pacemaker devices. And again, no one has found any sort of adverse event with any of these things. But again, it's all off-label at this point in time until further testing is done or our instructions for use is further mod modified and approved by the FDA. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, just add a couple uh, other dimensions from a clinical perspective. I, I think it really is, um, it's a matter of risk tolerance as the clinical provider, whether you're willing to take that risk. Um, I think, uh, and, you know, probably Frank and others can comment more in a more informed way, but I, I suspect the FDA has a slightly more conservative stance, and that's, that's fair. They're, that's their prerogative. I, I, I do think that certainly the expectation, just based on the physics that Matt can explain better than I, um, the, the expectation is that these devices certainly will be safe. I'll say in our own experience, we've scanned patients with a, a, a mechanical ventilator with uh, CVVH or renal replacement therapy devices, uh, infusion pumps that are uh, infusing life-saving uh, medications, and and so really high, um, you, you know, high-risk environment. We've not encountered uh, any safety concerns. So I think as a field, collectively, we have to decide what's a reasonable set of parameters to uh, approach this. And and I suspect that there might, you know, institutions might come up with a different set of uh, criteria or local criteria. But I, I will mention that uh, again. A lot of these pacers, by the way, are also uh, are also quite compatible with mm -hmm. conventional MR, and that was uh, that was demonstrated in a uh, in a trial. And so per that's certainly one mechanism um, uh, in which we, you know, collectively as a field, we could pursue that if that if it ends up being a barrier to uh, to imaging these patients. But I, I think there's unequivocally this is a um, an area where uh, a low magnetic field device really shines. I, I agree with with both of those things, and and just to, to sort of say um, along what Eddie was saying from the research side in my group at six and a half millitesla, we've been working with some colleagues at Yale, and we've been looking at spinal implants um, and things like this, which are non-magnetic per se, but they're paramagnetic, maybe paramagnetic, and, and we've been looking at sort of reduction of susceptibility artifact issues. Um, I think, you know, to, to 
follow on what Taylor said, operation at low field, it's, it's beneficial in two ways, of course, right? There's the tug, which is reduced, but also the SAR is really a concern. I, I'm actually on the MR safety committee at Martinos, and we have to deal with on a daily basis almost issues around our 7T, right? And so we're very, very careful because of deposited power. So operation at low field, be it 64 or six and a half mil Tesla is beneficial in that regard. Um, just to frame discussions going forward, I want to clarify that it, at least in my group and in, in papers from our collaboration, we refer to ultra low field based on the Los Alamos definition of 10 millitesla and lower. So ultra low field is below 10 millitesla, 64 millitesla is low field. So that just so we don't get our wires crossed. So I guess the question that also comes up with respect to these uh, implants is that uh, many of them have requirements for checking the programming and, and the mode that the implants are set into. So do you have um, any insight into whether at low field or very low field and then at ultra low field, whether uh, that type of programming is still required? Because from a clinical standpoint, that can get in our way uh, sometimes in the ICU environment and so on, getting the, uh, the personnel in to do that. I have no comment on that. Eddie, do you have any, any thoughts about that? Again, officially, you have to kind of follow the manufacturer's guidelines mm -hmm. anecdotally from a variety of things. There haven't been any changes. For instance, programmable pace, programmable shunts in our pediatric hydrocephalus study and the like. But mm -hmm. officially, party line, you have to follow the guidelines. I, I, I agree. I think as long as we need to develop an empirical evidence basis for, for it. And I think as that accumulates, I think I think the comfort level for that safety factor will will increase as well. Didn't wasn't there just an announcement from FDA where a five gauss line is now nine gauss line? I mean, didn't, didn't that just there was? I saw something the other day about this. So <laughs> slow progress, but but at least uh, there are things. Okay, I'll ask one more, and I think Omar has uh, one of the other audience questions, but there's one more that was entered in the chat. So let me just um, ask about that. Oh, actually, and I, I just will add. Um, uh, Dr. Selick actually added that based on his experience, he doesn't know of any passive implant that's been tested and labeled at 1.5 or 3 that would pose a risk to a patient undergoing MRI uh, operating below 1.5, which I think uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, so the other thing I would add to that, Adich, is it has to be within the 5 or 9 Gauss line, right? So in this scanner, you're talking about two and a half feet from the tip of your nose. So anything subclavicular right. and beyond would be is, outside, is outside of the uh, field. Um, so, Actually, um, if I may, Eddie brings up a very valuable point, right? Because we're talking, you know, as patients get older, as the patient population get gets older, people have hips and knees, right? And those people are precluded from high field, may be precluded from high field neuro scans, but they could be scanned on these uh, purpose built smaller scanners. So that's a very, very good point. <laughs> So the other, there are two that actually I'm going to link together, um, which are that, um, and these are questions about stroke. They're kind of related. One is whether we can reproduce the detection of hemorrhage uh, that we currently use CT for, and thereby include or exclude patients for um, RTPA. And the other is just a general question for you, Dr. Kimberly, about what you feel the optimal scan time is then in which you would want to image for this, uh, for the when trying to time the stroke in terms of where looking for a mismatch of DWI versus flare catching up to it, so to speak, would fit into your workflow. What, when do you envision using the imaging? So the first is hemorrhage, and the second is where and what time frame does this fit into your stroke workflow for imaging? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to answer the the DWI flare mismatch first because I think it ties into this other conversation, which is. As if you can sort of streamline the process of getting a patient into a, into the scanner, I mean, that just say it, it just sort of moves everything along. And so if in a future state, we don't even have to think about implants and their effect, that really is transformational because a lot of the time and energy and minutes are spent much, frankly, much more than the image acquisition are spent trying to figure out what make and model of XYZ implant is in there. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it, all of these are interrelated, but um, I, I just want to highlight that as a, as a key step in, in really um, in, in, in the, in highlighting the value of the, the, the low field scanner. So, so then the answer, I mean, as always with, with clinical patients is that uh, there's there's every type of patient out there where we, you know, some can tolerate for 30 minutes, um, 
uh, others for 30 seconds. In general, as a rule of thumb, clinical patients are less able to remain still than normal healthy volunteers. I would say that we're, we're now in the realm of about uh, 15 minutes for a you know for acquiring these images, and that's to, to me that's pretty darn good. Um, it's certainly within striking distance for for embedding this in a clinical algorithm, particularly in a patient population that wouldn't have any other treatment option anyway. Um, so I, I think that's to answer that question. Uh, we've also been very interested in whether this could replace uh, CT and you know, perhaps using this to identify and differentiate hemorrhage from ischemic stroke. And I think there are a couple caveats to that, but I do think that's a possibility. Again, it really depends on the particulars of the algorithm. I would say as a clinician, if, I, if I'm in a scenario where I have a CT scanner where I can put, you know, work with the radiologist to put them in uh, within, in some cases, like within 10 minutes of a patient arriving with to the emergency room, they're in the CT scanner. I, you know, I'd say, what's the added value of trying to replace that with the low field MR? Well, there maybe there are scenarios where it's useful, but it's not going to beat uh, the CT scanner on time. And that's okay. Um, uh, but there may be other scenarios where it's the sweet spot for the a low field scanner. For example, in a pre-hospital setting. Maybe we, we, you know, if you envision the scanner being uh, located in a EMS truck and it's out in the community and there's a stroke patient and it's a long travel time to get into an ED, uh, having that EMS truck with a scanner located there, uh, meeting that, that patient and scanning out in the field might be an opportunity. So, it, it 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 depends is 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 probably the the safest way to answer that. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're giving thrombolytic, um, you're looking for a test to be uh, very very sensitive for the detection of hemorrhage. Um, our experience, we've been using it in uh, some of our trauma patients as well as uh, um, op operative patients. And and though you can detect hemorrhage, I'm not sure the sensitivity right now would be at a level that that doctors might be comfortable. Uh, um, uh, giving lytics. So that's one of the things that will have to be uh, thought about. But uh, as, you, as, you, as you say, uh, in environments where there's no access to any other alternative imaging, then, then some imaging is, is, could be better than no imaging. So um, that, that really does open the door perhaps to uh, these being used in, in those settings. And, and then also, of course, and this is work, you know, that, that Taylor and Kevin and I have talked about, you know, the idea now to do serial neuroimaging, not with ionizing radiation, right? So you have your initial intake CT, you make your decisions. And then really, you know, we're kind of starting to talk about new ways of practicing medicine, right? Where you could really monitor the response to therapy, you know, quantitatively, especially using some of these morphological measurements, you know, daily, multiple times a day. That's uh, really, to me, I think, you know, it's not the us versus them, it's the sort of we, right? In terms of modalities. Mm -hmm. I think maybe I can ask uh, the question that uh, I received, um, if that's okay, Aditya. Yeah, please. Uh, so first of all, uh, I didn't get a chance, but thank you, Taylor and, and Matt. Wonderful uh, talks, uh, amazing work that uh, that's happening there down in Harvard. Um, um, and uh, uh, Matt, uh, just an amazing lab you have down there. It's an absolute genius. It's like, if I use two words, it's absolute genius what, what you guys are doing there. Uh, so the question I have uh, is on the contrast agents. Uh, for low field. And um, the question is, uh, and I'll read it out. In high field, uh, we use a brute force techniques uh, for gadolinium. And I, I presume they're saying, you know, looking at uh, blood brain barrier breakdown for MS, abscess, tumors, metastases. However, in low field, it has forced us to think outside the box. Uh, can you elaborate on what you see the future for low field MRI and disease specific contrast agents? Yeah, so that's a that's an amazing question. Um, so I did mention very briefly about these spion uh, materials, which are very very interesting. Um, we've been working uh, with those materials, both functionalized and non-functionalized. They work great. Um, there are ways again to get both bright contrast and dark contrast, depending on how you operate with them uh, sequence wise. Um, one thing which I did not get to talk about are the use of hyperpolarized functional agents. So things like saber 
which is a parahydrogen based uh, hyperpolarization method, is extremely efficient at ultra low field. And in fact, for proton hyperpolarization, it's, it turns out it's maximally efficient at 6.5 millitesla. I didn't know that 20 years ago when I built my scanner. And we've shown, and this is through a big collaboration with, with uh, Thomas Tice at NC State and Ed Checkman at Wayne State and, Ed, and uh, Boyd Goodson at SIU, Carbondale, um, that you can, you can deliver, you can hyperpolarize, deliver, and image um, all kinds of functional processes. You know, not just the thing that people know about, like C13 pyruvate, which people typically use DNP for, um, but other interesting things like FDA approved molecules like metronidazole. These things can have 20 minute T1s in vivo. So, so I think what's happening is that hyperpolarization uh, from molecular imaging approaches has been going on as a field for, well, I mean, I, when I was in grad school in the 90s, we were talking about that, right? At the same time, low field MRI is coming to maturity. Um, these hyperpolarized agents can be used for high field, as they've been for a while, but there is essentially no loss in SNR using them at low field. Again, these are exogenously polarized agents. So this is a long answer, I apologize. But I think um, in terms of molecular imaging, um, functional imaging, metabolic functional imaging of the type of things like blood barrier breakdown or redox status or things like this in vivo, it will probably be some combination of new, um, maybe spion-based materials, um or or um uh or manganese you know manganese is coming online as well um and hyperpolarization yes thank you that's it's a whole uh, whole new exciting field um and i think yeah. we'll have to have you back we'll have to have you back and just talk about contrast and low field, and low field. I, I would love to i mean you know like <laughs> low field mri is democratizing magnetic resonance imaging right hyperpolarization yeah stands to democratize molecular imaging and PET imaging, right? PET is, of course, amazing. You know, we count single photons and they always have that sensitivity against MRI, but there are lots of interesting use cases um, for hyperpolarization and low field, so. Right, thank you. Aditya, I think there are a couple of more questions in the in the box. Maybe we can do those two and then, um, and then uh, we've gone quite a ways over time, but that's okay. Uh, you know, interest in talk uh, and subject. So I think we have to give it its uh, due attention. So um, I'm going to ask the one question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what is the lowest possible detectable spatial resolution for ischemic changes and for hemorrhage in your experience? So maybe, um, well, actually, perhaps um, both Eddie and Taylor can, can speak to this. And, and Taylor, Taylor and first. Kevin both have reported on that. So I'll defer yeah. to. Taylor citing the works in the separate studies, one for each. Yeah, Eddie, I was hoping you would actually answer because I don't okay, think fair I've enough. measured uh, the exact millimeter size. It's somewhere around, so, you know, somewhere around. So, you know, so in, in their reported, in size, but <laughs> I, I have to confess, I don't have the number off the top of my head. In their reported studies, they were saying four millimeter detection yeah. for acute ischemic stroke as well as intraparenchymal hemorrhage. That being said, our typical slice thickness, effective, these are 3D sequences, is five millimeters. So I throw it out there when I'm asked, approximately five millimeter detection for acute ischemic stroke, as well as interparenchymal hemorrhage, with the caveat, inferior posterior fossa, due to greater brain motion, it's going to fall down a little bit. I don't know if Aditya wants to comment based on his clinical experience as well. Yeah, I think that that sort of gels with what we uh, what we have found. We the flare is probably the kind of workhorse sequence for yeah. deciding whether a, a lesion is present because of uh, artifacts still on our version of the DWI. We're excited to see the one that uh, that uh, Dr. Kimberly is working with now. But um, uh, and yeah, the other challenge with the posterior fossa is that it's very sensitive to patient positioning. Uh, within the coil. And so we we have trouble sometimes getting good coverage of the posterior fossa. So yeah, I, I think that that gels with what um, what we've experienced. But I will state that in terms of detecting hemorrhage, at least for me, I've been looking for sort of T1 hyperintensity. That's sort of been the usual clue that you're looking at hemorrhage. And I don't, we have seen cases of um, small subcortical hemorrhages that are simply not visible on, on, on the um, uh, uh, low field system, at least currently. And so I don't have a lower limit of, of detection of hemorrhage, which I think will be an important uh, factor for if, if you're making decisions about um, 
uh, you know, thrombolytic therapy. So, so I don't quite have that number down. Uh, what, what Thank do you, you. Uh, Taylor, do, do you uh, have any? Yeah, um, no, I um, agree with everything you said. I think the five millimeter uh, threshold is is cer certainly the case. I think it's probably, in my experience, a little bit lower, but but I think that's a good rule of uh, good rule of thumb. And uh, you, you know, just in terms of the newer uh, hardware and software in relation to coverage of the posterior fossa and, and the DWI, DWI sequence, I'll say, mm -hmm. um, in our experience, there's there's substantial and notable improvements that that we've 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 observed. Taylor, how about correlates with flare with T1? Um, you know, for us at ultra low field, T1 is kind of a proxy for diffusion because T1, you're looking at correlations at kind of one over the Larmor frequency, which is a couple microseconds for us, which is like macromolecular exchange. So in rat uh, MCA occlusion models, we see hyper acute stroke on T1 with T1 changes of like 25 to 30% in like 10 minutes. So have you seen clinically any markers on T1, just out of curiosity for stroke? Yeah, I mean, certainly it's the uh, uh, the T1 hypo intensity is really quite obvious, particularly in the subacute phase. Yeah, I, I think um, you know in the hyperacute phase, the the B uh, the B900 has really gotten quite okay. good, and 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 that the SNR is sufficient where where just visually on the, by eye you can you can now see. Um, very reliably uh, a stroke. So, okay. I mean, I, I think, you know, that, that that sort of answers the clinical question. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those interesting differences in field strength where native T1, if you're at the correct field strength, which is too low to make really good images, gives you stroke contrast. It's just one of those funny things. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, one last question I'll uh, pass it back to uh, Aditya to summarize and, and close this webinar. Uh, this is from Dr. Edda Wallace, and uh, our question is, there are remote hospitals or locations in Canada which would benefit for remote management of these patients. Is there any work going on with them? Maybe I'll just add uh, answer that briefly from our experience. So here at Queen's University, where I am, we have a, a, a research partnership with Winnebago Area Health Authority, which is a uh, hospital in remote northern Ontario. Uh, along the James, James Bay coast. And we have a 12 month project with a hyperfine unit uh, up there right now. And um, uh, the study is almost finished and we're uh, about ready to publish our pre uh, prelim results on the feasibility of portable MRI in a remote setting. And of course, we're, we're talking about all different things than the, than the typical ICU uh, patient uh, population. And that's a lot of interesting uh, lessons to be learned, I think, from, from that and which would be a applicable to not just Northern Canada, but remote uh, parts of, uh, of, of the world everywhere, really. Um, and, uh, you know, there's probably a, a large utility of portable MRI in a remote setting compared to, you know, all the discussion we've had in ICU and in the hospital. And uh, I think there probably are going to be lots of, of benefits that we don't even know of yet, uh, not just in terms of uh, direct patient care, but indirect impacts on on, you know, on public health, uh, costs, benefits, et cetera. So we are looking into that with our portable MRI unit in uh, Moose Factory, and, and uh, we will have something um, uh, hopefully by the end of uh, this year to uh, to say more on that. Any other comments? And Eddie, do you have any experience from, from other so, parts of the world? So we actually do on a couple of different fronts. There's a partnership between Hyperfine and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to look at deployment in low, you know, low in, low and middle income countries where the use case is phenomenal. Actually, there was a picture of Steve Schiff in one of these typical sites. There was an earlier site in Blantyre, Malawi, where they're looking at in the setting of cerebral malaria that was actually reported in the AJNR and presented at the ASNR about a year ago. So the ability to just take something and plug it into the wall outlet and get images clearly has a phenomenal public health benefit and effect. And absolutely, you know, we're democratizing healthcare without a doubt. Eddie raises a really valuable point, which is that, you know, a lot of the work that's being done in sub-Saharan Africa is about population health as well. And, you, you know, it's just not ethical to use X-ray CT for population health. It's just not, you know, you don't scan young kids to do, say, 
you know, brain morphological measurements following post-infectious hydrocephalus or something like that, a screening tool with ionizing radiation. And so this really opens up, I would say, new ways of, of um, you know, getting to the patients and, and getting data. Thank you. Aditya? Great. So I think with that, we will conclude. I'd like to thank um, our speakers, uh, Dr. Uh, Rosen and Dr. Kimberly, for those uh, uh, excellent presentations. And uh, thank you to uh, Eddie for being on the panel. And I'd like to thank my co-host, uh, uh, Omar Islam, for uh, uh, organizing this with me. Um, just to let all of the um, uh, participants uh, know, we'd like to thank you for joining us. And we'd like you to know that the, uh, the intention is to have this uh, webcast posted on the Portable MRI Journal website, which is portablemrijournal.org. Uh, Portable MRI Journal is intended to be a free open access uh, online uh, peer reviewed resource for the uh, community of scientists and radiologists uh, and, uh, and clinicians who are using this technology. It's sort of a, a work in progress and we're uh, looking to currently aggregate information there as you'll see on the website, but also to take submissions, case reports, um, and really to use it to sort of um, build up an experience with best practice with this technology, because at least from our perspective, I feel like we're, we're still learning very much so. Uh, not just how to interpret the imaging, but how to operationalize and use the devices and how to um, integrate them into clinical care and research. So, um, so we will have this, uh, this uh, uh, webcast posted, and it's our intention to hold these periodically uh, with people working in the field. So we hope that was uh, uh, useful and interesting to you, and thank you for joining us. <laughs>